Well, hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. If you don't know who I am, you happen to just pop up on this video. My name is Jessica Likewise. I'm the CEO of Hope Education Services, and I'm a BCBA who's passionate about contributing to our field, helping you prepare for your BCBA exam, and helping make sure you're a really great BCBA. I'm so excited today to be joined by three amazing guests who have made incredible contributions to our field, especially in the part of supervision. Supervision is so important because if you're anything like myself, you didn't receive formal training in your schoolwork while you were taking your classes on supervision. So you're left trying to figure things out and figure it out as you go, which sometimes can lead to ineffective supervision. Well, these three amazing women have come together and created one of the best resources our field has ever seen to ensure that we have a guided, a structured approach to supervision that's based on data and leads to really great supervisors improving client outcomes, improving mentorship, improving BCBA morale, and really making sure our field is doing things the right way. So I'm so excited to bring them on today. I'm going to introduce them one at a time, and I'm going to formally read you their bios because they've done so many amazing things, and I want you to understand just what a privilege it is to listen to hear them speak today. So the first person I'm going to introduce, the head author on the book is Hannah Jurgens. She's a BCBA. She received a bachelor's degree in psychology from Grand Valley State University in 2011 and a master's degree in applied behavior analysis from Rowan University in 2013. Possessing over a decade of experience in the field of ABA, Ms. Jurgens' work has included the Princeton Child Development Institute, the Bancroft Linden's programs, and the Kager Behavioral Group. Ms. Jurgens has also presented her research at several national and international conferences, including the Applied Behavior Analysis International, ABAI, Association for Professional Behavior Analysis, APBA, and the Florida Association of Behavior Analysis, FABA. Topics include supervision, toilet training, and elopement studies. Currently, Ms. Jurgens serves as a BCBA for Positive Behavior Supports in Grand Mac Rapids, Michigan, where she facilitates and directs the ongoing programming and supervisions of cases for toddlers, adolescents, and adults with autism. Ms. Jurgens has a passion for all things research, ethics, and professionalism, and uses her role to instill these attributes to future BCBAs and BCABAs. Um, Hannah, welcome to the, today. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. I'm excited. Awesome. So I'm going to introduce guest number two, Dr. Carly Cordova. She received her bachelor's degree in human growth and development, her master's degree in counseling psychology, and her doctorate degree in educational leadership with a minor in autism. She's a BCBAD. Dr. Cordova has worked in the field of ABA since 2001, consulting in a variety of schools, clinics, home group homes, and private homes and has been a board certified behavior analyst since 2004. Dr. Cordova's expertise resides in the areas of teaching functional life skills, conducting research in applied settings, disseminating ABA through effective and systematic supervision and building capacities with organizations. Additionally, Dr. Cordova served as Florida's Gold Coast ABA's vice president and subsequent president and as a Senate board member for the credentialing of ethics behavioral organizations. Academically, Dr. Cordova works as an adjunct faculty at two ABA, graduate ABA programs. So welcome, Dr. Cordova. Thank you. So happy to be here with you today. And we're happy to have you as well. It's a privilege and honor. I'm going to introduce Dr. Ulema Cruz. She received a PhD in education with a concentration in applied behavior analysis from Nova Southern Southeastern University. She is also board certified behavior analyst doctoral with 20 years experience in the field. Dr. Cruz is an assistant teaching professor at Rutgers University. Her academic interests include ethics and supervision in ABA. She also teaches ABA courses in Spanish. Additionally, Dr. Cruz is an ABA consultant and supervisor. She works in the field of development of supervision systems and the dissemination of ABA to other countries and languages. Dr. Cruz also provides advice in the area of ethics and supervision as part of the international ABAethicsHotline.com. Dr. Cruz was elected to serve as part of the Florida Association for Applied Behavior Analysis Board for over six years, holding the positions of member at large, 
President and Co-Chair of the Legislative and Public Policy Committee. Well, welcome, Dr. Cruz. It's a pleasure to have all three of you guys, amazing women, who just done so many great things for our field on my channel. Thank you so much. This is so exciting. Thanks again for the opportunity. Absolutely. So I want to dive right into this. So I know for me, I have been in the field for a very long time. I've only been um, formerly a BCBA for just over a year. But I can tell you that I don't feel like I, when I for, when, went through my training, I really had effective training on how to be a supervisor. I had great supervision. I had an amazing supervisor, and he really did model some great strategies for me. But I don't I didn't have formal training on how do I measure myself? How do I make sure in self-management I can assess what I'm doing and make sure that what I'm doing is data-driven, like right, like our field stands for. So what prompted you to really help people like myself to be able to have this um, amazing tool to really assess ourselves and put this book together? Um, I think I'm gonna let Hannah answer that question because this was her initial idea, her baby. <laughs> so take it away, Hannah. Uh, so the three of us are part of a research group for FSU and it's pretty much just a bunch of nerds who love research and love talking about it and helping each other. And so for a while there, they had to listen to me um, moan and groan about supervision and difficulties with students and um, just the issues with teaching others how to supervise the way I did, which I prided myself on being a really good supervisor. I was one of the practicum supervisors for FSU. And I kept thinking and like dreaming up this idea where I kept saying, you know, as I would toss students between me and another supervisor, and I would say things like, ah, oh, I wish there was like an AFLS I could give you for this person so that you don't have to start over. You don't have to get to know them. You can just pick up where I've left off as a supervisor. And I would mentioned it a couple times in research group, and it was like this big pipe dream. And then um, 2020 happened and I was going through some life changes. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do it. And so I roped in these two ladies because I knew it was something too big for just me and I needed more brain power and I really wanted it to be lady brain power. And I realized I was surrounded by lady brain power. So I kind of met with Carly and Ulema. Um, we had a, a friendship that had developed too. And I said, you know, we really need to do this. This is something the field needs. It's something I'm passionate about. Ulema has her dissertation in and Carly is also very passionate about it as well. So we decided to go for it. And it was like, I kind of gave them this sample of what I dreamed in my head. And between the three of us, we just made it a reality. And it was like, the more we did, the more inspired we got. And, um, you know, I swear we're a, a group of humble women, but there were moments where we sat there and were like, holy shit, this is, this is big. This is amazing. Like the more we wrote, the more we were writing heavier and more detailed things. And just, we gave out samples to a couple BCBAs to say, you know, what do you think about this? And those BCBAs were like, holy crap, this is what I've needed. This is what I wanted, which then just lit more of a fire under us. And um, it was kind of crazy though, because COVID was happening, um, which ultimately gave us a lot more free time, I think, than, <laughs> than we normally gave ourselves because everybody's forced at home. So it became this really awesome distraction project for me, at least, um, and, and probably for you guys as well. But we did it and we wrote it and we had the people who tried it, who were also passionate about it and really interested and couldn't wait for it. And I think that whole year, I mean, we, we plugged it out right away and then we gave it out, you know, we published, we gave it out for everybody. We told everybody we wanted feedback and we meant it. And then we got a slew of feedback and we revised the whole next year in 2021 and we produced the second copy. And now we're just about to release another book in the next few weeks called The Consulting Supervisors. So, I mean, this is just a dream that I shared with my friends that I love so much who are amazing and I'm really glad that you guys trusted me with this crazy idea. And I mean, just look at it now, you know. Yeah, I love that. And one of the things I think is that amazing people did amazing things um, during COVID. You know, when the world shut down, I think we all got to see what we were made of. And yeah. a lot of the people who are watching my channel, like myself, made the decision, you know, for me, it had been years and years in the field to finally go for that BCBA certification, right? It allowed us to stop to assess and look at our life and decide, you know, what, what do we really want? 
And I think that, like you said, is that sometimes we get distracted. And I know in my personal life, I was so busy. I was distracted and I was, I, I thought I was happy and I thought I was fulfilled. And until I, I got time to sit back and look right when there was no gym and there was no happy hour and there was no going to the mall after work and everything was shut down. And you had to take a look and say like, what am I doing here? Like, what is my purpose? I've been in this field so long. Why haven't I made the contributions that I know I can make and I know I want to make? And so I do want to applaud and congratulate you for making that choice. And honestly, all the people watching my channel, and, and I know that there are hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people who are going to watch this video, who made the decision, I'm going to, I'm going to improve my supervision, I'm going to open an ABA agency, I'm going to get that BCBA certification after working in the field for 10 years. And I know, um, Dr. Cruz, you talk about women from all over the world, or, and not just women, we love men too. But, um, you know, I do have a special heart for, for helping women around the world. And one of the things I love is that when I teach my courses, my BCB exam prep courses, like even just yesterday, I had over 10 countries present. And I love that we get to disseminate this information all over the world and make sure that our field is growing, but it's growing in an effective way so that we are producing really good supervisors and really good BCBAs. So um, Dr. Cruz, Dr. Cordova, I want to invite you guys. Why, would, why did you say yes? I just always love to hear why people say yes, because I know um, strong women and powerful women are constantly being asked to do something. And every time we say yes to something, we're saying no to something else. So what prompted you to say yes to this project? Well, um, Dr. Cordova and I had previously worked on a very early edition of something similar, not to the level of brilliancy that Hannah presented to us, but um, something um, kind of similar years ago, um, 2010, I think it was. Uh, we did it in conjunction with three other behavior analysts um, while we were working at Nova Southeastern University. And we never really got a chance to publish that. And um, when Hannah brought this idea, it sort of seemed like a chance to revive some of our old work and morph it into something greater. That's, you know, that's one of the reasons why I said yes. Um, I leave it to Dr. Cordova. Yeah, sure. I think well, we had worked on that book. It might have been task list three or task list four. So, you know, there's been new task list updates, there's new ethics code. So, you know, we had an idea of how to structure supervision from when we had worked together before a dozen years earlier. Um, my kind of first experience in supervision was at the university where I had just started the week before and they said, okay, you're going to supervise this graduate student. And I said, well, what do I do with them? They go, just whatever research you're working on. I said, I just started a week ago. I don't have any research I'm working on. And my brain, I'm just like, I need something to do with this human. And, you know, and so I just kind of started making assignments and basically like programs, like we write for our students, I would write for my grad students. So there was some kind of structure to it. And it really kind of took on over there. And that's just how I think I like things very structured, um, you know, in a sequential kind of systematic way. So um, you know, Hannah's idea to start this with all the new updated um, guides that we had from the board was familiar, but it's also so, so needed. I, you know, I think with the field growing the way it has, there is no other kind of systematic, systemic, you know, um, competency-based measures that really meet all the guides that the task list asks us to and that the ethics code asks us to. So for me, I was really excited about it. And we picked a date and we're like, okay, this is the day we're gonna start. And, and we did, and it was, a, it was an adventure. And I think the three of us working together that there's a real synergy. Um, you know, we come from different backgrounds. We have different experiences. You know, one of us will bring up an idea. I'm like, yeah, that's brilliant. I've never thought of that before. Or like you said that, okay, you know what that made me think of? That made me think of this. And there's just this real energy and buzz around writing it too um, for ourselves, but that we see the bigger picture too. We're looking at the whole field. We're looking at all these future BCBAs that you know are about to sit and, and students in the field and just people who have it as an idea in their head. You know, we want to provide them with this really structured experience to know that they're getting, you know, a good experience for themselves and, and that we can promote ethical um, you know, supervisory practices moving yeah. forward. We realize that um, 
students now are a little bit luckier than we were because we didn't get any formal training and supervision, as you mentioned at the beginning, Jessica. And um, now they're, they're getting courses in supervision, which is great, but we don't want new uh, or newly certified BCBAs to feel like how we felt. What are we gonna do with this person? Where do I start? And so part of what we provide in our supervision handbook is the foundational skills assessment, because just as we do assessment for our clients, our kiddos, as we often call them, we should also be doing an initial assessment on our supervisee skills, on our trainee skills, and um, give us uh, some type of baseline, a starting point, you know, what to teach, um, how much of it, and so forth. Um, so that was a lot of our intent going into this and, and saying, yes, Hannah, we're, we're committed. We're, we're doing this. Yeah, I love that. And so who, who is your book designed for, right? The supervisor handbook, is this designed for organizations? Is it designed for BCBAs, for BCBA trainees? Who would benefit the, from the book or would everybody benefit in a different way from a different stage of their journey? Um, so I think we initially wrote it for the supervisor, but when we were working on it, we decided to take all angles in the approach that we were looking at so that the supervisor should want it for every supervisee. The supervisee should want it to track their skills and an organization should want it so that they can see the growth of their students and the growth of newly certified BCBAs to make sure that they're remaining and maintaining skills and generalizing skills. Um, because it also then gives them the foundation to do things like promotions that are based in data rather than, oh, I really like them, let's pay you more it can help them structure their systems of support in terms of like identifying who is a good supervisor, who do we not want supervising at our company, um, which again can come with like promotions and pay raises and everything and operationally defines those skills so that uh, the organizations, you know, it's, you hear a lot of BCBAs talk about, oh, well, I haven't practiced long enough, so I don't make that amount of money when it really shouldn't be that, right? Skills should be awarded, not experience or timelines, unless those are going into your skills as well, of course. Um, and then the in a per perfect world, schools would want it too, because they want to make sure that their skills that they're training, the knowledge that they're providing the students are in turn being transferred into those actual practice and applied skills, because that, in my opinion, is the biggest deficit because school work is so heavy. The importance of graduating is obviously you have to graduate to even be able to sit. So there's this huge priority and I feel the pressure from my students on, I need to gain the knowledge. And so this applied work kind of goes on the back burner for them. And then they pass the exam and they might not actually know how to practice as a BCBA. So we took the full approach where the book is beneficial to anybody involved and can have a lot of different purposes and serve a lot of different needs all across the board. So I, as a supervisor, I have a copy for myself. And then when I take on supervisees, I require that they use it as well. So that if I don't have them for the entirety of their supervision, which tends to happen, then when they transfer to another BCBA, they don't have to start fresh. They can just say, this is where I'm at. These are my skills and these are my target new skills that I want to acquire for the next X amount of months. What do you ladies think? Yeah, um, the, the skills that, um, as Hannah was talking about, that the trainee has demonstrated and it has been trained on by the supervisor's graft um, on a visual chart that looks similar like to a VB map or an AFLS or an ABLES and Essentials for Living, that kind of visual um, chart that we're all familiar with in the field. And so it's easy for the next supervisor to just as a, at a quick glance, look and see what experience that supervisee has and can match them better up with clients or they can prioritize, well, you have these skills, but in this setting, we need to prioritize on these skills because that's what's applicable for this job or field work setting. And so it kind of saves a lot of time to, as Hannah was saying, not to rehash, like I don't need training on verbal behavior again. I have a years of experience. I've demonstrated skills. Hey, let's move on to, you know, more complex skills. Um, and so it doesn't, um, you know, 
make the field work uh, or trainees hours repetitive because they have those 2000 hours to fill and they can really focus on areas of interest to them, areas that need to be developed. And for the supervisor, they can prioritize those. Yeah. Imagine as an agency owner, you're interviewing a candidate for the first time, a BCBA candidate for the first time, and they pull out the supervision handbook and they show you exactly how many skills they're proficient in. And you can see it with data, colorful, beautiful data <laughs> that is self-graphing right in front of you. Who are you going to pick? Are you going to pick that candidate or are you going to pick another candidate who perhaps you have no knowledge of their skill level or their skill set? So I just, what you say. <laughs> exactly. I just want viewers to kind of picture that. That's the kind of world that we want to move toward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And so what are the, what advice would you have to um, supervisors, you know, you who maybe are supervisors now who are a little bit lost, what advice would you give them to be better supervisors? Or maybe there are BCBA trainees watching this who do have the privilege of being able to start fresh and haven't done this yet. How do they start the right way? And how do they use this supervisor handbook to really become good supervisors? So I think my big advice is to read through the criteria that we have created because we really did operationally define the task list material and the BACB task list has been diluted and it's one phrase for a plethora of skills that should be targeted, right? So we took each one of those and we really broke it down so that it's in order to master that box on the task list, there's, you know, 33 skills that maybe they really need to know. And so when, when you look at the task list, a BCBA supervisor who's struggling might say, I don't know what to do with this. So for me, the, the criteria sections that we've set out with examples and task criteria, and then um, just even like, what is the overall question here that you're wanting to seek an answer to for your supervisee or your trainee, if it's somebody that maybe you're a little farther along with, um, it's the area that will help you learn more about what exactly you're teaching or, oh, you know this term, but that's not it. Now we need to apply it. Now we need to demonstrate proficiency with using it with an actual human being, right? Um, or if it's OBM in a, in a different setting like that as well, you can also apply the book there. So I think looking at the criteria and really familiarizing themselves with what each question is in the task list so that they know exactly what's being asked of them as a supervisor to provide training on and what exactly the trainee needs to demonstrate, not just spewing information and getting an answer, right? It's not an intraverbal that we're looking for. It's an actual permanent product situation. Yeah. If you're a new supervisor and you are experiencing imposter syndrome, we can help you there. You don't have to figure it out all on your own. We provide you with a foundational skills assessment. We provide you with a starting point so you can sit back, relax, and say, let me just look at my foundational skills assessment and start there. <laughs> let me just then um, select the skills that my supervisee is going to need to learn one by one. From there, you don't need to be overwhelmed anymore. You don't need to feel like you're inadequate or you don't know what you're doing because we've provided this very um, structured and sort of broken down and spelled out um, tool or instrument, as, as we might call it sometimes, for you. So um, all of those feelings of, you know, imposter syndrome or whatever can just wash away. I love that. And you brought up the task list and said that, you know, you felt that it was a little bit diluted. And, you know, for even for myself as someone who does teach the task list, right, all day, every day, that's what I do. You know, for me, task list I is the most confusing part. For me, sometimes I can even be lost on how to direct and help my um, my trainees and so supervisors, anyone who you know is is I'm working with and teaching. 
I want to help support them and I'm lost. And, you know, it's very obvious to me, okay, what is differential reinforcement of alternative behavior? I got that, right? What is a DRL procedure? How do you use NCR? Those are all things that we are so entrenched in our field. And even if you, like myself, haven't been a BCBA, you still use those principles for a decade. And now all this new material, sometimes I don't even know where to direct them. So I love that you brought up the task list. So how can trainees use this book to help them understand the task list better? I think it's that doing part. So one of my big reasons for wanting to write this book and create this manual and, and direct supervisors is because there's a lot of emphasis this on the knowledge and I'm very passionate. I know that it's been shared. It's like memes all over the place where you could you could pass a BACB exam, but that's the bare minimum of being a BCBA. So you get the letters, but can you use them? Do they mean something to you? So when you look at the task list, somebody can spew off knowledge, right? Somebody can say, oh, a DRL is this, but can you write a protocol? Can you collect data? Can you interpret the data? Can you then make decisions with your data on how to either change your protocol or fade it out? Or what do you do next? And that's the part that I find is the heaviest that's missing is that there's the students themselves are placing such an emphasis on I want to understand it and know it. But doing it is what's going to really lock it in their brain so that they can not just regurgitate the information, but they have a level of understanding because they've done the hands on part. Um, so then when they go to the exam, not only are they going to be able to pull the information from their brain, but they're going to have a level of understanding that as soon as they read the question, they don't even need the answers to remove, you know, the, what's it called when you, you know, it's not A or B, but it could be yeah, the your, process of elimination. Yeah. They don't even need that. They can just produce the information from their brain, which I think is the difference between a BCBA who's knowledgeable and a BCBA who knows how to practice. Yeah, I love that. I tell my students all the time, if you need to read the answer choices, you don't understand the question. Right. Um, that's and, one of my favorite sayings to, my, to the trainees. Yeah. And I, I experienced this firsthand as a new BCBA. I had a very intensive case that had very severe head banging. Now I had worked with kids who had, or I, I've written definitions for head banging. I've written protocols for behavior reduction. I had written protocols for crisis behavior, but actually implementing them was a whole new ball game, especially when I had to really consider dignity of the client and protection of myself and the staff. I was asking to do these protocols and procedures, right? Something BCBAs overlook is, oh, you just get in there and do it. And you're like, not even considering the safety of anybody involved. Um, so for me, that was something that stuck with me very early on with having that lack of supervision requirement of, okay, now I'm going to have you go and do this protocol. You wrote it. Let's try it. Because when I tried my own protocol, I couldn't do it as an experienced BCBA. So how could my staff do it? And it's just something that I think um, we really wanted to incorporate in our book is if you know something so deeply that you can implement it, then you really are knowledgeable on it. What do you ladies think? I'm just going to add on that um, you know, a couple of the sections, um, G uh, heavily, which is behavior change procedures, <clears throat> we kept in a few items that um, were not carried over from task list four into task list five because we felt they were so important and they're so heavily utilized in our field, like on a day-to-day -day basis, things like um, functional communication training and um, use of AAC or light tech, you know, low tech, high tech um, things, you know, simple things like visual schedules and point boards, boards or choice boards or PECs. PECs is an accepted part of the field. It's not on our task list though. Um, and so those are a couple items that we kept in and task analyzed. They have criteria and uh, for demonstrating competency on each of those things. So those are some of the items that are carried over in addition to the task list. And additionally, we have three other sections in the book um, beyond I. We have sections J, K, L, which for us focus on um, what's it, case management, uh, professionalism, and then fading supervision. And so what we like to talk about is when the field shifted from that 1,500 hours to the 2,000 hours, those last 500 hours is really focused on you doing and learning to do the job you know, preparing for the next. You're not a student anymore. Now you're going to be ex expected to demonstrate these skills. And so that's what we're really focusing on. You might know clinically how to do a DRO, do a DRI, you know, implement a token system, 
but can you supervise your RBT to do that? And that's often something we're not taught in school. We're just taught the basic of the science, but now you're expected as a BCBA to supervise other people, but you're never trained how to supervise other people, even in a clinical setting, not even talking about field work um, for the trainees, just even as a clinician. And so we really focus and have those items available for people to use beyond so that we can prepare them to be competent practitioners once they pass the test. Absolutely. And one of the brilliant contributions that Hannah made to the handbook was the ethics flowchart, which is going to help those newly certified BCBAs train their trainees on how to go through those difficult and uncomfortable ethical conversations. And um, I mean, Hannah can talk about this a little bit more than I, because it was, again, um, part of her baby. And her great contribution, but it's it's going beyond just um, having the uncomfortable conversation. It's it's the actual process. Um, but go ahead, Hannah. Um, so yeah, I mean the ethics flowchart is not on the task list. We're expected to know the ethics codes, but again, being able to navigate them is something that you can pass the test without knowing how to actually do. Right? It's all regurgitation of information. So early on in my career, I experienced a lot of, you know, ethical issues. And for me as a supervisor, I always include my supervisees in the conversation, um, which at certain agencies was frowned upon, right? We don't need to be including people, which then I was like, I'm doing a disservice to my students to not let them see the, the regular ethical issues that come up uh, because people want to pretend like you don't have them, but I have six or seven on the daily that I'm actively working through. Um, doesn't mean I'm violating the ethics code, but I'm working through it. And so I decided that the way to teach it was to create a flow chart, this idea of yes and no systemology, where is this an ethical issue? Yes or no. If you answered no, it flows over here and it says, is there a moral issue? Is there a legal issue? Because sometimes those aren't always the same, right? Um, which then if it's a legal issue, it's like, is it a CPS call? Is it this? Is it that as mandated reporters, which a lot of our people in our field forget that they are. Um, and then it kind of takes them through this process where at first it's going to be very robotic, but we want to make sure that they know how to handle all of the situations. Um, I think a lot of people treat supervision where it's the experience you get is the one that you were open and available to. It's what you had in front of you. But we put in all the full ethics code and we even have a section where you mark it off. Was it contrived or was it a naturally occurring one? Um, and that kind of came about because the three of us also have a passion for, um, you know, the the. I don't want to say abuse, the disrespect of people in supervisory supervisor positions, right? There's a power struggle that sometimes can be abused. And so we want everybody to go through the full ethics code so that if even if it's a contrived situation, I can produce or Google a ethical scenario and have my student work through it so that they can have that practice. And that was something I think as we wrote that section between Ulema working on the ABAI hotline and then Carly and I both, um, Carly brings a lot of knowledge about like the school issues, right? When you're a BCBA in the school, there is a wild amount of ethical concerns happening because they don't have the same ethics code. And then I'm in the home and community and clinic um, so it's, it was a really great thing for the three of us to write, but again, it's not on the task list, which is why we pride our book on being that beyond the task list idea. Um, and I love that Carly brought up the three extra sections and why, why we were all so passionate about that. Um, and I think we got a little bit of flack for that, right? Where people are like, well, it's not on the task list. Why is it in the book? But we all stayed really true to ourselves and passionate that, you know, this is something where the book can be used even after somebody has their BCBA, right? Uh, con the companies that people are working with should monitor it. And I know Ulema had talked about that and I would love for you to mention it again, Ulema, on how to apply the book when we have BCBAs working in their first year with clients and whatnot and how a company can benefit from it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mentioned some of it already as far as selecting um, your interviewees, right? Selecting between somebody who can show you uh, with data, their actual skill level and someone who can just perhaps talk about it and you might be limited to just observing throughout that 90 day, um, what is it, probationary period. 
uh, what they're made of. <laughs> With our book, you don't really have to wait, which I think makes it um, a lot more practical. Mm -hmm. But Dr. Can save time, time and resources too. Yeah, you, know, you don't hire that person who can't demonstrate the skill. Some people can talk the talk and not walk the walk. Yeah, and it'll save your company. That. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but I, I, I also wanted to prompt Dr. Cordova to talk a little bit about uh, the systems perspective. Dr. Cordova brings so much knowledge on systems and um, she is the one who can collect data on anything. There's a quote by our mentor, Dr. John Bailey, who says that he talks about Dr. Cordova in his courses often about the one person and he's known in his entire career who can take data on anything, any behavior. And I think, I think that type of mindset and that um, just systemic framework, it's, um, I, I think it's invaluable and brilliant. So um, take it away, Dr. Cordova. I didn't even pay her to say that. That's so great. <laughs> <laughs> we were joking about it. Dr. Bailey had said that, uh, you know, a little bit ago when we were coming back from Dublin from the ABAI conference, uh, the international one, and I was in the line to check our baggage, me and uh, I had three of my children with me, and um, it was just taking forever, taking forever, and so I started just taking data. I was like, okay, it takes her three to four minutes to process a person, and I like counted all the groups of people in front of me. I'm like, okay, if it takes three to four, I'm going to miss my flight. And so I was relating this story back at our research group. He goes, see, that's what I'm talking about. Who takes data at the airport? <laughs> I guess it's me. Right uh, we, yeah, we, you know, using the book, I think of, you know, I, I do primarily work in school districts. I, uh, oh gosh, I think it was maybe 2008 was the first time I worked in a school district and I had started in the field in 2002. And I was in an interview. I wasn't really an interview. I just went to speak with someone um, in a new city I'd moved to and just said, hey, do you know anyone who's hiring? You know, what's going on around here? And they were telling me about their work in the school districts. And I was like, oh, gross. I don't want to work in a school. It's terrible. You know, it's they don't make changes. Everything's so slow. And they ended up offering me a job. And I was like, oh, I'll wing it. Let's see how this goes. I fell in love with working in school systems and I had, you know, home experience and clinical experience before that. And I thought, right, things take so long in school districts. They're less effective than me just going in and doing the work myself. And this is a system that needs our support, right? And there's so many organizations, even outside the field of, you know, developmental disabilities um, that can benefit from behavior analysis. I was at um, the Babbitt, the Berkshire Association of Behavior Analysis Conference, which is here in Massachusetts last week. And um, Dr. Antonio Harrison from California was talking about how he uses ABA to coach football. And he loves football and what effective change they won the championship um, first time in 10 years with implementing a very simple, like engaging with each player equally, you know, giving social positive reinforcement to each player and they want to you know the first time in 10 years and it's like brilliant that's how we can use the science to support and help so many people um across so many fields so um yeah that's what, how I like to use the book and support the book because I'm really thinking about a more systems approach and that that bigger picture not I mean it's great of course we want to support that one individual but um the cover of our first book I'm looking around to see if I have a copy the cover of our first book are like these connected um little bits of light. And in my experiences, if you had a crappy, sorry, I wasn't sure what the swearing allowed level is here on your show. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. No worries. If you have a shitty supervisor and that's all you know is a supervisee, and then you in turn start supervising people, that's all you know how to do is shitty supervision. And that self-awareness, you may not even have that you're doing it. So when I have a supervisee or even like a BCDA that says, what, how do you know how to do that? I go, my supervisor taught me your supervisor didn't teach you. And I go, no, I've never done that. And it's like, I, it just, it just keeps happening. It just keeps happening that these people are not getting this well-rounded experience, um, in their, in their field work. So we want to yeah. use, use it to support. It, imagine that you've been pleading for years to have someone who can point you to the light to how to create systems that are effective, that are ethical, that are going to translate in amazing client outcomes. Somebody who 
you picture having a mentorship relationship for the rest of your life? Well, your pleadings have been answered. Dr. Cordova is that person. I love that. And I love that you brought up, Dr. Cordova, ineffective supervision. And the reason I say that is because we know, right, as studying um, motivating operations, some people are reinforced by access. So they are going to be so excited about this book because it's going to give them access to being a great supervisor. And we know that some people are reinforced by avoidance, right? So there's going to be some people who are reinforced by this book because they want to avoid ineffective supervision or specifically the risks of ineffective supervision. So can you tell me this and then, and then we'll kind of start ha having to start wind up but before we do, what are the risks of ineffective supervision? The client, um, we have an ethical and for me, you know, being a BCBA is about my passion. I've always been passionate about helping people. Um, you know, I got a text message early this morning that my client went to church and mom was so excited. I mean, that's an important part of their life. They've never been able to go. I went with them one time, we worked on a couple skills and she kind of desensitized and it lit that fire under her little four-year-old self and she can go now to church. And it, that's what it is for me. It's the changing lives in ways that maybe I'm not don't really care if my client can go to church, right? That's not really the big thing for me, but it is a big thing for them. And it's a big thing for her. And it's a big thing for her siblings to have her there. And it's a passion project. And who wins is the client themselves, the family. You know, I want this little girl to grow up and remember me and the technicians and how much we loved her. That's what I want. And so the, for me, the, the, issue with bad supervision and the biggest risk is that every child deserves that every client deserves that every family deserves that and if we don't supervise good i know there's families who have been turned away from aba or families who hate aba you know there's clients who used to have aba and now they're adults and they talk about how traumatic it was and you know that's what is the risk that's what happens with bad supervision shitty BCBAs who should not be in the field, who should not be allowed near children or adults or anybody who, who needs ABA. And for me, I mean, I'm going to like get all verklumped here, but that's what it's about. That's why I was passionate about writing this book is because if I can prevent even a few bad eggs or bad apples from creating more bad eggs and bad apples, I mean, that that's at least some clients we've saved. And for me, that's what it's about. I mean, how lucky am I that I get to work with these ladies? Right? Seriously. Make it sound um, way cooler than we are. <laughs> that's just how I feel. <laughs> but good BCBAs um, and good supervisors are furious. They are constantly trying to do better. And thank you, Dr. Megan Miller, for starting this, uh, or Megan DeLeon Miller, for starting this amazing movement, um, Do Better. But Good supervisors instill the type of curiosity, not just for our field and our science, but curiosity about each and every single one of the cases that we work with. How do I do better for this client? How do I ensure that the skills I am teaching uh, my trainee on are going to translate to better client outcomes. They're going to generalize to other clients. They're going to maintain. They're going to look for opportunities to improve upon their skills. They're going to continue to grow professionally. So I think a supervisor uh, pretty much affects every part of the service delivery tier and risking. Um, or, or the, 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 the flip side of that, right? Having bad supervision, again, is going to negatively affect every single part of the tier delivery system. It's going to sort of be that, that roadblock that's going to shut down services. It's, it's going to shut down operations. And so um, it's, it's risky to have somebody at the top level trickling down all of these effects who are then going to affect people's lives forever. And this is time that nobody gets back. 
So we need to figure it out right from the beginning. Yeah, I love that. And I just encourage everybody to pick up the supervisor handbook. I know I am, I'm getting my copy. I'm so excited for it to come, um, especially after today, because I have started them. I have started with my first training and I want to make sure I do a really great Yay. job. Congrats. Thank you. So thank Welcome you guys. I know, right? It is a very big responsibility. But thank you guys so much for being here. I really appreciate you. We are going to include links in the show notes for everybody who wants to get the book um, and all of your other books as well. I really appreciate you guys, not only for being on the show, but for your contributions to the field. And I am very, very passionate about making sure we have ethical ABA. And I have done extensive interviews and work with autistic adults who did receive poor um, ABA services and really helping heal that relationship and also provide advice to BCBAs on what we did right and what we did wrong so we don't keep repeating those mistakes. And, you know, I had never thought of really supervision as being one of those solutions, but I think you bring up a really great point. And for so many people who are concerned about making sure we do things better in this next generation, this next time around, and those of us who've been in the field for a decade, I'm sure every, I'm sure all three of you would, you know, acknowledge that there's things we did 10 years ago we wouldn't do today because it's with the information we had. And I think this is really a very valuable and important tool for making sure we don't continue to repeat those mistakes. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you everyone who watched this video. Like I said, we're going to have all the links below and we'll see you guys on the next show. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.